Good morning, Bethel. So glad you joined us this morning. Can I just be honest with you? I miss you. I miss some things pre-COVID. I miss seeing you in the hallways, watching you walk in with your families. I miss running into you in the store. It feels like it becomes more and more of a rarity when that happens. And it can be pretty easy to focus on how our lives have changed in the last few months. And we can focus on how much we want it back to the way it was. But at the end of the day, I think the most effective things that we can do as a people is to be looking at not so much at what we can't do, but what we can. And so as our church looks forward into the next year, and as we begin to look at how can we, despite the fact that this pandemic continues to rage on, and despite the division in our culture, how can we move forward? And what can we do? Not what can't we do, but what can we do? And I think that a lot of our focus in the next year need to be on a couple things. One is getting deep into the scripture, the word of God. If we have God's spoken word to us, God's word, we ought to know it. And it's a great opportunity for us right now in this season to say, you know what, I'm going to get deep in God's word. I look forward to working with you to help us grow that way in the next year. And another thing that we can do, even when we're not able to do much, is that we can pray. We're in a series called Teach Us to Pray, and we've been studying the Lord's Prayer. Now, the Lord's Prayer is used twice in accounts of Jesus's life. One, Jesus is got all these people together and he's teaching them kind of what his kingdom looks like and he teaches them how to pray. The other is a passage in Luke and it says one day Jesus is praying in a certain place, meaning that Jesus intentionally went to a specific place to pray. It's good to make intentional space in your time to pray. Jesus does that. It says when he finished one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, just as John taught his disciples. It's interesting to me, if you think about what these men had been around, they had watched Jesus deliver in the Sermon on the Mount, probably the greatest sermon of all time. They had likely uh, watched Jesus do miracles and healings and all sorts of things, and yet they didn't ask him, Jesus, show us how to do that. They asked Jesus to show them how to pray. Now, they were familiar with prayer. They had seen prayer done in the synagogues, in the temples. They had seen it done on the streets. Many of them had experienced patterns of prayer in their life. But Jesus goes on to instruct them, perhaps because it was going to be, in the coming days for them, an important thing that they could do. That once Jesus died and rose from the dead, that there would be a time in which they had to wait before they could do anything. They had to wait before they could take much action, and yet they would be able to pray. And Jesus says to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us, for we also forgive everyone who sins against us, and lead us not into temptation. Now, just to walk back the last few weeks, what Jesus is giving them is not a prayer that they just say every day as some uh, mathematical equation to get what they want. Jesus is showing them a model of how they can pray. And he tells them to call God Father. And this is very significant for them. So when we pray, we go to God as a good Father. Jesus tells them to speak to their Father. And then the scripture says, hallowed be thy name. Part of life in prayer is to talk to God, our good Father, but also it's an act of worship in recognizing who God is and allowing God to continue to reveal to us who he is because God is a relational God who wants a relationship with us. And we, so we seek his kingdom on earth is what the scripture tells us that he tells them to pray for his kingdom to come, for God's kingdom to come. We talked about last week this internal battle that we have in wanting our way, but in reality, prayer is often about God aligning us with his way. We seek God's kingdom here on earth rather than our own, and to be honest, it takes constant prayer 
to tame that internal spirit in us that wants our will. We trust in God to provide for us. He tells them to pray to give them each day their daily bread, to give them what it takes. That God, in essence, we are praying for God to then give us what it takes to carry out His will. Today, I want to talk about something a little different, something that if you grew up in church, may be laced with some ideas that are unhealthy. Jesus tells them to pray to God to forgive their sins. A word that was often used in church growing up and a word that maybe you and I have heard is the word repent. Now, I think that so often in our culture, repentance is viewed as, oh, that's ugly. To repent, that is like a moment of your pride dying. That's the moment of embarrassment where you repent and you admit that you were wrong. In reality, repentance is actually turning from something that is drawing us away from God. So that when we go to God, that if something is, is pulling us away from him, that would be for our detriment. But being close with God is for our good. And one of the things that we need help with is breaking the habit or the behavior of sin so that we can remain closer to God and continue to see God revealed. And so being able to repent to God is not a punishment, but actually a gift. So there's a story later in Luke, in Luke chapter 19, about a guy named Zacchaeus. It says, Jesus entered Jericho and was passing through. There was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector and was rich. So Jesus is going about his ministry, and he passes a guy named Zacchaeus. Now, by all means, all of the Jewish people would have been immediately gasping to hear that Jesus came in the presence of Zacchaeus. After all, Zacchaeus was deplorable, according to the Jewish people. He was a tax collector, which in Jesus' day and age meant that he purchased the rights to tax the people, he paid Rome on behalf of the people, and kept everything that he could for himself that he didn't have to pay Rome. And so he was consistently robbing his people. The scripture in Luke chapter 19 refers to the fact that he was rich, not because it was bad to be rich, but because he was a tax collector and rich, which meant that he had gotten rich off of his own people. And so the Jewish people would have heard that Jesus came through this place, and surely he wouldn't pay any attention to the evil Zacchaeus, but that's not the story. In verse 3, it goes on to say, and he was seeking, Zacchaeus was seeking to see who Jesus was, but on account of the crowd, he could not because he was small in stature. So Zacchaeus is looking to see who Jesus was. I find it interesting. Here's a man stuck in sin, viewed as unworthy of being in the presence of God or let alone a rabbi. Yet when Jesus comes here on earth, He seems to be seeking him. So maybe you've been told that when it comes to you and your life, that God wouldn't want anything to do with you. But when he was here on earth, Jesus seems to have an interaction with the person who would have been considered the most deplorable. Maybe, just maybe, Jesus has come to town and he is in your town and he is seeking a connection with you while you are trying to figure out who this Jesus is. I don't know why you wondered upon this video this morning, but I wonder if maybe Jesus isn't making a connection with you. It says, but on account of the crowd, he couldn't see Jesus. Man, if you're a Christian this morning, know that there are people around you who are trying to seek Jesus. Would you all agree with me that you did not find Jesus because you were good? You found Jesus because Jesus drew you to him and you needed him. Now, the Zacchaeus is here, but he's not able to see Jesus because of the people following Jesus. Let this be a warning to those of us 
who are following Jesus, that we either make space for others to see Jesus or we keep them from him. And scripture is really clear that Jesus isn't cool with us creating stumbling blocks for others to get to him. It says he could, <coughs> couldn't see because he was of small stature. So he ran, ran ahead and climbed up into a sycamore tree to see him, for he was about to pass that way. So he, Jesus is coming through, and he goes and climbs up to try to see. He just wanted a view of Jesus. It wasn't even in his mind that he might have an actual interaction with Jesus. He was just hoping to catch a glimpse. And I think for so many people who are following Jesus, they settle for just a glimpse of Jesus when part of what happens when we pray is a deep connection and relationship with him. We may not be able to do a lot of things, but we certainly can pray. When Jesus comes to this place, he looked up and said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. Now understand, a lot of people were following Jesus. Some of them may have felt like they had a right to Jesus, and that surely because they had been traveling with Jesus for a while, or certainly because uh, they were well thought of and not poorly thought of, that Jesus would stay at their house. But it seems that for some reason, Jesus, the character of Jesus, likes to engage with the people who are nothing like him. You see, Jesus loves people who are nothing like him. And I found it over the years that people who are nothing like Jesus in Scripture often liked Jesus. So it goes on to say, So he hurried and came down and received him joyfully. Joyful was the response of Zacchaeus. Grateful, thankful, glad, joyful that he had had an interaction with the rabbi. That God far exceeded what he thought he might see. We don't know exactly what he was looking for, but Zacchaeus seems to have this incredible joy at meeting Jesus. When Jesus draws you to him, maybe you can react like Zacchaeus. Hurry, come down, and receive him joyfully. And when they saw it, they all grumbled. Isn't there always a they? It, it always kills me in conversations when somebody's like, well, you know, there are a lot of people who think. Well, people have names. And they have the ability to communicate for themselves. And it seems that there was a grumbling going on amongst the people. And they began to judge Jesus. Do you know that religiously, the religious behavior will often lead you to judge someone you're not really qualified to judge. Here they are carrying out their religious rules, their religious way. They're really following Jesus in all these ways to hear what he says, to hear the things that he says so that they can uh, say that this man is claiming this law or this way of living. But they're really judging him and they're missing him. And yet Zacchaeus, who receives Jesus joyfully, seems to gain something here. And Zacchaeus stood out and said to the Lord, Behold, Lord, notice that he calls him Lord here, giving Jesus the status he's properly due. The half of my goods I give to the poor, and if I have defrauded anyone of anything, I restore it fourfold. What happens here is that Zacchaeus has an interaction with Jesus, and just the continued interaction with Jesus, just this interaction with Jesus, seems to inspire him to repent. Now, there was something about Jesus when it came to Zacchaeus that Zacchaeus said, I, I can be honest about what I've done and who I've been. And even if he had been honest to the people around Jesus there, he may have not been accepted still because of what he had done. But he immediately begins to turn from his behavior. So when we pray to God to repent, then when we repent to God, we often find the strength to turn away from our sin. It's not an ugly thing at all. It's actually rather beautiful and empowering to repent. The ability to repent is a gift, not a punishment. So many of us, when we go to God in prayer, we go with our tail tucked as if, well, God, I've messed up again, when in reality... It's God, I need your power and your help 
to be better so I can turn and be closer to you. And Jesus said to him, today salvation has come to this house. Jesus was telling him, because you've repented, because you are wanting to turn, I have saved you from something you could not save yourself from. For the Son of Man came to seek and save the lost. What does that mean to be lost anyway? Scripture often teaches that our sin requires the punishment of death. But through the death and resurrection of Jesus who pays the price for us, we can experience salvation. That we were destined for death and eternity far from God, but because of Jesus, we can be in permanent relationship with him. And it's the gift of that permanent relationship with him that leads us and draws us to change. It's one of the reasons why so many people never experience the change God promises it's not because God's not willing to do the change. It's often because we're not willing to go to God authentically about who we are and our deepest struggles. It's why in church groups we tend to say the little sins that everyone will smile about. Oh, I eat a little too many pieces of pie. No one's going to judge you too hard for that. But the reality is we all know of deeper struggles, deeper sins. Jesus does not seem to be scared of what everyone else around him thought was most filthy. Repent means to change our minds about sin, to turn away from sin. For many of us, we sin because we are trying to fill an area of our life that can only be filled with God. We lean into things and trust things rather than trusting in God. And repentance means going to God and turning into him and looking at him and continually going to him with our sins so that he can do a transforming work in us. By the way, the reason that we go to him is that if we could have stopped on our own, if we could have made right what we've done, we would have already. Some of you are of the mindset that if you feel guilty enough that what you did will be taken care of. And the reality is, if you had had the power to do this on your own, you would have already. That maybe the gigantic step for someone in this crowd today, or maybe the gigantic step for someone watching today, is that you just go to God and admit what he already knows and ask him for the power to change. That one of the things he's telling his disciples is that repentance is an important part of their relationship with him. And it's not so he can beat them or work them over or lord over them that they're horrible. It's so that as they become aware of their sin, they can become more aware of his goodness. And his goodness is a transforming figure in our life. In Matthew chapter 3, verse 8, Scripture tells us that we produce fruit in keeping with repentance, that ceasing the habit of repenting our sin will keep us from producing what God wants us to do, that perhaps the thing that takes us to the next step, that maybe the thing that will move a church to the next step, that th maybe the thing that will move you in, on a personal level to the next step is recognizing, calling out, and turning from your sin. David, in Psalm 51, he repents. David, the man known as the man after God's own heart. He says, created me a clean heart, O God. That repentance is recognizing the fact that our heart needs cleaned and renew a right spirit within me, that God, I don't even have the power to change this thing that is in me, but you can. Once again, in Psalm 51, he goes on to say, cast me not away from your presence and take not your Holy Spirit from me. He knows that being in close contact with God is necessary to live his life the way that he needs to. And as we go to God in prayer, one piece of that is continually removing any obstacle that keeps us from him. And ultimately allowing him to remove those obstacles. For some of you, there's something that has come to your mind today and you're like, I know that keeps me from God. You know, that habit, that addiction, maybe the fact that you really haven't fully trusted God yet, even though you would say so in church, but you hold back a part of you because you don't think God can change it. 
And it may be that as painful as that may seem, the one way to get through it is to take it to him and repent of it. You see, we've had a confused picture of repentance. The Jewish people had seen religious people repent. In really big ways, they would paint these really dramatic pictures in their prayers of themselves. And they would often talk about how they had turned away from the worst. And they would often try to make themselves look big and look good because of what had happened. But gospel repentance is not that way. Gospel repentance, the real repentance is about the goodness of God, not the badness of man. See, religious repentance that's so often taught is a self-righteous repentance of just stop sinning. Be strong and stop sinning. And the reality is gospel repentance is coming to God humbly rather than proudly and arrogantly about our ability. Is coming to God and acknowledging that he can do what we cannot. In 1 John chapter 1, verse 9 to 10, it says, If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. That somehow trying to live as if we don't mess up creates a facade between us and God. God can do anything with what we're willing to give to him but so often we don't put things in his hand. You see, the religious repentance that we've so often been taught is taught with this level of bitterness that, oh, I have to acknowledge my wrong and how horrible it is to acknowledge the wrong. In reality, it's actually freeing to acknowledge that you don't have it all together and it gives God space to be God. We wouldn't need a God if we had it together. The reality is, though, we do and he does. See, gospel repentance is filled with hope. Not that I have to forever stay stuck in who I once was, but gospel repentance says that when I bring it to God, he will transform me. And listen, repentance may not be a one-time thing for you. For so many of us, we the first time that we face a sin in our life or a struggle, we're often like, okay, I asked God for forgiveness, but then I messed up again, and so maybe I'll just kind of hide that from now on. I'll pretend that's, that's taken care of, even though it's not. And in reality, gospel repentance means that we have hope that God will do something great with what we did wrong. 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verse 10 says, Godly grief produces a repentance that leads to salvation without regret, whereas worldly grief produces death. When we truly repent, we own our sin as sin. We don't say, I am a mistaker. We say, I can be a sinner. We own our sin for what it is. For so many of us, we make excuses for the things that we do. Well, you know, I was raised like this. Sin is sin. And until we call it that in the presence of God and allow God to begin to move its way in, nothing will change. Jesus tells his disciples, the guys who followed him closely, the guys who had watched him, he tells them to ask for forgiveness, to repent. We all When we truly repent, we confess before we're caught. We're patient with the people that we've hurt rather than saying, well, you need to get over it. Everybody messes up. We seek to make restitution. We don't neglect to seek help. Sometimes when we go to God for repentance, he produces avenues for us to get better. And when we truly repent, we go to God very humbly and teachably. For so many of us, one of the greatest knocks in our prayer life is that we aren't asking God's Spirit to teach us when we repent. We're telling God how it will be. And in reality, it's the teaching of the Holy Spirit that transforms us. Norville Geldenheis says, when Jesus comes into a person's life and gains authority there, selfishness and dishonesty, honesty are irresistibly eradicated 
that what Jesus does over a period of time, as we give him authority in the places of our life by repenting, is that he begins to eradicate the selflessness and dishonesty and the sin, and he makes space for his goodness to be worked out in our life. I want you to think today, what sins have you tolerated in your life? What does it look like for you to repent? What have you taken and who have you hurt? I mean, this interaction with Jesus seems to move Zacchaeus to restitution. He offers to pay back what, is, what he's wronged. Yes, for many of us, we need to go to God and be willing to say we messed up. For some of us, part of that repentance is actually letting others know that we did wrong. Hey, Bethel, you can focus on what you can't do right now, and you will be upset all the time. But I believe as a church, our next step is to be focusing on what we can do. When we can get together and worship, we're going to. When we can get online, we're going to. When we can pray, we're going to. When we can get in God's word, we're going to. We may not always be able to gather in the ways that we would like. When we can, we will. But we will be more united when we are a church that is praying together and when we are a church that is in the word together. I would encourage you to begin to daily pray the Lord's Prayer. Now, don't just say the words. I mean, you need to memorize the words or even look at Scripture, but often be thinking about, is there an area that I need to repent? Is there a place that I need to, look, to hear from God? Be thinking all those things and be looking every day at Scripture. Be in the Scripture in some form or fashion. Specifically, we can all be united in looking at the verse of the day on you version. I want you to know this, Bethel, that if sometime during this message, God placed something on your heart that you're uh, convicted of that you believe needs to change in your life. Now would be a good time to turn off this video and go to him and repent. Uh, I will promise you this. You will be met with a loving God who's glad to be in your presence and glad to transform your life. I love you, Bethel. Have a great week. Hey, thanks so much for watching. Are you ready to take your next step? We would love to hear from you. You can send an email to hello at Bethel.us. You can send us a message on Facebook, or you can let us know in the Bethel app. And speaking of the Bethel app, take a moment, if you haven't already, to go to your app store and search Bethel Putco to download our app. There's all kinds of great resources in the app. You can listen to messages, you can view the messages from Sunday morning, and you can also fill out a digital connect card. You can do that today and each week to let us know that you're tuning in. You can also find some great information about our Bethel Kids Ministry and our Be The One Student Ministries. Also in the app, you can give. It's one of three ways you can give. With online giving at Bethel.us slash give in our app, Bethel Putco, or through text. Hey, thanks again for joining us. We hope you have a great day and know that you are loved.